Hi, we're going to do the internet chapter now. And it's kind of strange that it's the most, you know, advanced medium so far, but your book writes like you all are second graders. Um, it includes a lot of terms in your book that you already know. So I'm just going to go over a few basic things, and this video lecture will actually be much shorter than the others. Okay, so here we go. A couple terms I want you to know about the evolution of a new medium. There's the novelty stage, the entrepreneurial stage, and the mass medium stage. Right now the internet is in the mass medium stage. But when it started it was in the novelty stage just like everything else where it's very new. Only the early adopters have it. The entrepreneurial stage is when people try to figure out how it can be used and how to make money from it. All right. But now we're in the mass medium stage where almost everyone has access. Every medium goes through these stages of evolution when they first come out. So how did it start? When was it in the novelty stage? Well, like all good technology, it started with the Defense Department in 1969. Remember then we were in the middle of the Cold War worried about getting attacked by the Soviets. So the military wanted to figure out a way that the computers could talk to each other in the event of a nuclear attack. So they developed something called the Advanced Research Property Net, ARPANET, which actually turned into the first network system. So it started as a centralized network with the Department of Defense in the center, right? Then it became decentralized network where you have the Department of Defense and some research institutions, University of Illinois, Harvard, MIT, um, having their own networks all connected. But now it's a distributed network, meaning that if, you know, if, um, if Google goes down, the internet still works, okay? If the Department of Defense shuts down, the internet still works. There's enough of a net where the um, breaking of one link isn't going to break the chain. So here's where this would have been the decentralized stage of the network. How it was just a few things connected. But now, even though this looks like a blood clot, this is a visual representation of what the World Wide Web actually looks like with different countries based in different colors. I took this photograph um, from an image on the wall at the St. Louis Science Center, and it's fascinating. Red, of course, is China. If you see the fluorescent green there, that's the United States. So we're actually a very small amount of internet traffic globally. All right, so your book says that there are some things about the internet that make it different from other media. Okay, it's interactive. We call it content on demand. Of course, now television is getting to be more and more like that. But we're producers, not just consumers. You know, when we go to the movie theater, we're watching media created by other people. We're watching media created by Hollywood studios. When we get on YouTube, most likely, we're watching media created by people just like us. It's the democratization of media content is the term for that. We talked about media convergence already this semester, but really every form of media is available on the Internet. So even if everything else ceased to exist, we would still have television shows on the Internet, books on the Internet, Movies on the internet, music on the internet, magazines, everything on the internet. It's convergence. Don't forget, that's an important term. All right, so what technology is needed to make all this happen? Number one, you have to have digital communication. You have to have microprocessors. And don't forget Moore's Law says that computer chips basically double in power every 18 months. So, you know, when you leave um, Best Buy with your new computer, it's pretty much outdated by the time you get it off the, the parking lot, sadly. The next um, big technology that's needed for the internet explosion, as it, as it was, is the fiber optic cable. This tiny little hair can transmit every issue of the Wall Street Journal ever published in like one second. So the digital communication, the microprocessors, and the fiber optic cable all came together at the same time to make the internet accessible and um, fast for us. Do you remember dial-up? Do you remember that horrible sound? Oh, me too. There's a term called digital divide. You're going to hear um, teachers talk about it. You're going to hear politicians talk about it. What it represents is the resources that people who have internet access have compared to those who don't. And if you think about it, where are job listings now? They're not in the paper. They're online. Scholarship information, online. College applications, online. There's a lot of learning opportunities online. So just by having online access, you have many advantages over someone who doesn't. So when people talk about the digital divide, they're trying to bring that together, bridge it, so that everyone has the same internet access. We're going to talk about the First Amendment in class. 
this week because, you know, the First Amendment was written like in the 1780s something. And the phrase that we're looking at here is of the press. See that? Because when the First Amendment was written, that was the only thing, that was the only form of media that the colonists were concerned about. It's the only one that existed. They wanted to make sure that Joe down at the corner printing shop could print whatever he wanted about the government and have that be okay. Have him not be arrested. Now, fast forward to 2014. Suddenly the First Amendment has to cover such a larger range of media. It has to stretch so that now it has to provide freedom for magazines, books, radio, billboards, television, internet, movies. It's interesting because I will always have some students say that the First Amendment should be updated to make sure that no one gets offended. And you know, it's an, it's an interesting conversation to have in class because how would you update the First Amendment for 2014 if you could? Food for thought. Is there anything online that is illegal? Yes, we'll talk about that in class. Anything that should be illegal? Well, we'll discuss that. Remember, it's very hard to monitor online material because of the sheer volume and the fact that much of it does not originate in the United States. So it's very difficult for us to apply American laws to something that originated in another country. We're going to talk about the Lori Drew Megan Meyer case for sure. Those of you who grew up in St. Louis are probably familiar with this story. If you're not, we'll talk about it. Um, we're also going to talk about some cyberbullying legislation that has been suggested and whether or not that's a good idea and how to enforce it. So get excited. Okay. The biggest difference in the web in the last 10 years is right here on this slide. If you look at this, the column on the left, those are the biggest websites traffic wise from 2005. Okay. Now look at the column on the right. These are the highest trafficked websites in 2014. User generated content. That's a big, big, big deal. Most of the websites that we spend our time on now contain content not created by huge multinational media conglomerates. It's media produced by us, for us, by our friends. We contribute to Craigslist, we contribute to Wikipedia, eBay, MySpace. I know, MySpace is still on the list. Uh, YouTube, Facebook. It's all user-generated content. I would imagine next year Twitter will probably be on that list also, which is also user-generated content. So it's the democratization of media production that has changed the list of the most trafficked websites. And I think that makes the internet itself the most interesting medium because we are now creating it from the ground up, a true grassroots media movement. All right, we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about in class this week, so see you then.